We are at the beginning of the most important week in the life of the church. But more than that, uh, it's the commemoration of the most important week in all of history. The week that kicked off um, on what we call now Palm Sunday, the day where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, saying loud and clear for all who understood their scriptures that he is unequivocally God and King. Uh, The week that then proceeds to the crucifixion, which we will gather together to remember on Friday, and the resurrection, which we will gather together to celebrate on Sunday. But before we get to these earth-shattering events, I want us to take a moment to pause and reflect on some of the words that Jesus spoke on the night he was betrayed. His last night gathered with all of his friends, he speaks so many important, encouraging, challenging words, which you can find in uh, John's gospel especially. But there's, there's one theme that's kind of woven throughout what Jesus is saying that I want us to pick up here. In John chapter 15, verses 5 to 6, Jesus says, Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. See, what Jesus says so many times in so many ways is that if we want to do anything worth doing, we actually require Jesus at work in our life. It is actually Jesus who needs to do the things if there's something worth doing. Because we on our own cannot produce anything of real substance and meaning. And Jesus says that the way this happens, the way that we see his, his good work take place in our lives and through our lives is by remaining in him. I love that language that Jesus uses so often in this last conversation with his disciples of being in Christ. He says that he is in us as we are in him. That as he is in the Father, we through Christ are in the Father and the Father in us. By the Holy Spirit of God, we are in God and God is in us. It is Hard to wrap our heads around sometimes, I think, to really truly grasp that the God who created the universe dwells in us. He chooses to make his home in us who believe, who give our lives and allegiance to King Jesus. And Jesus says that if we want to be Uh, if we want to be fruitful, if we want to do anything of real worth, we need to remain in him. Because here's the thing. The things that God wants to do in your life require his life in you. It is actually only God at work in us that can produce life, that can do the things God wants. See, more than any result God wants connection with us. He wants us to remain in him, to allow him full access to our lives so that he can do what he wants to do, so that he can do his good work in us. I like the language of uh, the vine, the branches, and the fruit, because here's the thing about uh, plants. The branch itself can wither out and die, or remain fruitful, and it doesn't actually affect the plant, right? See, the plant as a whole draws in the nutrients and then passes it up to the branches so that they can hold fruit. And what happens if, for some reason, a branch does not receive the nutrients it needs? Does the whole plant die off? No, but that branch stops producing fruit. It's lacking the life that it needs and it withers up 
and falls off or is cut off by the gardener. In the same way, Jesus wants to produce good things in our life and through our life, but it is not us who does it. We determine how much of his power, his life, his freedom is flowing through us and how much we're restricting what God wants to do in us. I I love um, how Paul describes the good work of God in our life, the fruit that the Holy Spirit of God grows when we remain in him, to use the language of Jesus. Paul says in his letter to the church in Galatia, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that Paul says we notice as proof that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. These are the good things that God's own Spirit grows inside of us when we are allowing His life to flow through us. Now, I just want to pause here for a second because we hear this list and we recognize rightly so that this is what a Jesus follower should look like. These are descriptions of who Jesus is, the perfect image of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is King Jesus himself. God made human for all to see. He displays these perfectly. And we, as Jesus followers, We know that we are supposed to look like this. These are the characteristics that should mark us. And then we take this list and what we love to do, consciously or subconsciously, is say, these are the things I have to do. I have to produce this in myself. I have to make myself more loving, more joyful, more patient and kind. But this is not a list of behaviors that we are to um, try to build in ourselves. Paul doesn't say that the Holy Spirit desires this kind of work from us. He says, no, no, the Holy Spirit of God produces this kind of fruit in us. We do not determine what the Spirit is making in us. We through the choice to remain in Jesus, remain in connection with him and let his life flow through us, determine if this fruit will grow or if we will prevent it and wither up. Because here's the thing about the fruits of the Spirit, the good work that God wants in our life, it is not what you are doing, it is who you are becoming. It is not about what you perform, what you do. It is about who God is shaping you to be. It is the work of God, not of ourselves. And this, I think, is where it gets a little bit tricky for us because we know that anything worth doing takes a lot of hard work. So I know some of you enjoy working out. I say some of you because that is not me. I enjoy working out my brain, but not my body. I do not find it enjoyable because I recognize it takes a lot of hard work that I would rather not put in. And that I'm not going to get that if I don't put in the hard work. We know that, I I, I make it sound like I never work out. I eat relatively healthy and I mean, I'm active-ish, right? But some of you like, you're you're dedicated. You get up early, you go and, and you, Uh, push yourself to your limit because you know that the, the end goal is worth the striving. So we're used to this kind of culture of, uh, of if we want something good, we have to put in hard work and others might be able to help us, right? Like you may have a personal trainer who tells you like, you know, maybe don't eat a bag of chips for dinner. Maybe like eat something green, Uh, maybe like sleep once in a while and then try these workouts, but they can't do it for you. They can set you up and create the space where you can thrive, but only you can do the hard work. But it is the complete opposite when it comes to the work of God in our life. 
It's actually God and God alone that does the heavy lifting. I love this promise of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. I think if we're honest, sometimes when we look at what what we should be as followers of Jesus, when we look at the list of the fruits of the Spirit, when we look at the life of Jesus, We feel tired and worn out from trying to produce that in ourselves because it's actually impossible. What God wants to do in us requires the life of Jesus working in us. So Jesus says, if you are weary, if you are worn out and heavy burdened, Come to me and receive rest. How do we receive this rest? He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, what is a yoke? It is not just that, uh, the, the, the fun yellow part in the center of the egg. That is yoke with an L. The yoke Jesus is talking about, as any of you who understand like agricultural references from Jesus' day will get, Um, It's the thing that you would like bind oxen together with so they could pull the plow or pull the wagon. But in Jesus's culture, because it was full of so many people who understood this reference to the agricultural world and way of life, rabbis, the Jewish teachers of scripture, uh, they would use the yoke as a metaphor for their teaching and their way of life. The things that they taught and the things that they demonstrated. They would refer to as their yoke. And what Jesus is saying here is, look, if you are realizing you can't actually do this thing on your own, come to me. I will give you real rest for your soul. I will lift that burden off of you. But here's how. Be yoked to me. Remain in me. So um, I want us to think about the vine for a minute. Have any of you ever seen a good, healthy plant just growing wild and free with no structure to support it? Not usually. Especially a, uh, uh, like a grape vine, which is along the illustration that Jesus is going for here. For it to actually grow and thrive, it requires something to hold it and sustain it. Otherwise, what happens is the branches, they get... They, they, they get all tangled up and mangled and they cannot get the life-giving nutrients from the vine and they will wither and die. So they build trellises, structures that the vine can wrap around and allow good fruit to grow. It is the plant uh, drawing the nutrients up and passing it out to produce the fruit, but the structures create the space for that to happen. And... Um, I've never worked with oxen, but I have worked with enough um, teenagers, which are kind of like oxen, stubborn, um, bullheaded, can do a lot of great things or harm if they uh, are just kind of left to run for themselves. If you try and get two teenagers to move in the same direction, it's not gonna work, unless there's something pulling them together. If you try and get two oxen to pull together, they're going to begin to drift off from the other, unless there's something holding them together. This is true of all people. We need, if we're going to move in the same direction, something that binds us, something that, that uh, some kind of structure that holds us together. And what Jesus is saying is, look, if you want to experience the rest, the good things that I want to bring into your life, you need to be yoked to me. More than just saying like, yes, Jesus, I belong to you, but you actually need something in your life, some kind of structure that holds you to me and allows me to work in you. This is why um, I think the the best definition of what it looks like to be a a thriving person of Jesus, uh, as we like to say around here, uh, to live a life that celebrates God, 
I think a follower of Jesus is a person shaped by the spiritual practices and marked by the fruit of the Spirit. The greatest of which, of course, is love, according to the Apostle Paul. Right? What are the spiritual practices? Well, when you look into the life of Jesus and the teachings of the apostles, you see that there are things that they make non-negotiable. You look at the life of Jesus and you see that Jesus prioritized certain things, that there were things that were so essential to his way of life, to what it means to be a, a human created in the image of God, living for the glory of God, loving God and neighbor. And the apostles pick up on these themes and elaborate them for us in their letters in the New Testament that help us to understand these important aspects of the way of Jesus that are foundational in the life of a Jesus follower. And then down through church history, um, followers of Jesus have looked at these, these things, these practices and said, how do we do this in our day, in our culture, in our lives? in a way that is meaningful and creates space and structure for the life of Jesus to flow through us and produce in us this good fruit, right? These are the spiritual practices, um, the spiritual disciplines, the way of Jesus. See, it is not that um, Jesus is gonna produce good things in our life and we don't have any part to play. He is the one doing the heavy lifting. Our role is to create the space for him to work, right? To use that illustration of the vine that we began with. If Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and he and he alone can grow good fruit on us, in us, we need a structure that can support it. We need the practices to form something where God can work. Because let's face it, our culture is not exactly built around creating space for God to move in our life. In fact, if we don't live in a way that is kind of different than the world around us, it is so easy for us to actually go an entire week or longer without having had a meaningful encounter with God. Think about it though. Our world does not prioritize the things in the way of Jesus. Our world does not prioritize creating space to allow the Spirit of God to do deep and meaningful work in us because our world prioritizes speed and efficiency and, and uh, productivity. Our world says, do the things. Jesus says, be in me. So this is what the spiritual practices are. The practices are a way for us to make room for Jesus to work in us. The practices are the yoke that holds us to Jesus, the, the trellis that supports the growing vine and fruit. And here is the work that God wants to do. Right? I, I think we know that God makes each of us unique, that God has plans and purposes for our life, that God wants to do something in and through each of us. And because we're all unique, there's unique calls on our life, but there is one core thing that God wants to do in every single one of us. In fact, the priority number one of the Holy Spirit in your life, Romans 8 verse 30, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What is it that God wants to do in us? He wants to form Jesus in us. He wants to form us to be people who in the way we live and who we are reflect Jesus. Um, I, love, I love this, uh, this call of Jesus. I feel like we don't use this enough as our come to Jesus moment. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. See, for Jesus, the defining moment of who he is in his full obedience to his father, his full and complete love of God and neighbor went to the cross 
He died in our place to get rid of our sin, rose from the dead with brand new life so that he could come in, work in us, place his spirit in us, and then the spirit begins to shape us to be people like Jesus, people who look and act like Jesus, to be people who are shaped by the spiritual practices, marked by the fruits of the spirit, the greatest of which is love. See, um, this kind of shaping to be people who look like Jesus, uh, some have called to be cruciformed, I love it, to be shaped like the cross, to be so marked by the way of Jesus that everything about us is different, our priorities are different, the way we think and live and breathe and act is different because we are shaped by Jesus, our King and God. So that's all good to know, but how do we actually take that and live it out? Because it's not going to do anything if we don't apply it. We can know all we want that actually the only, the only way that we're going to become people who look like Jesus is by creating space for the Holy Spirit to work in us because we can't do it on our own. But if we just know that up here and we don't live it in our life, it is meaningless. So how do we do this? I think step one is know the disciplines. We actually have to know the spiritual practices that we're talking about, these structures from the way of Jesus that allow us to live this out. So in your app notes, you're gonna find resources uh, for like some videos, websites, books that you can dig deeper in because there are a whole bunch of different spiritual practices, but they all fall under kind of six umbrellas that are pillars in the way of Jesus, non-negotiables. Like this, if you are a person of Jesus being shaped by the spirit to become like Jesus, then Jesus and the apostles say, these are must haves in your life. These are not optional extras, but actually foundational to being formed into the image of Jesus, right? So these kind of six uh, six chief pillar disciplines that all of us as Jesus followers need in our life our prayer, conversation with God, worship. We need to adore God and and give him the glory that he is due. Scripture, God reveals to us in scripture what is true and how to live the life that he has for us. It is essential that we are in scripture and allowing it to shape us, giving. Jesus so loved the world um, that he died on the cross. God, the Father, so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. We, the people of Jesus, should be people marked by generosity, modeled after Jesus' own generosity. Evangelism. Did y'all know this is a spiritual discipline? It is a practice in the way of Jesus. Jesus who came to preach the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. Who then sends his people out to proclaim the good news to all creation. To make disciples from every nation. Right? Evangelism. Good works. That, that act of lovingly serving those around you, doing things for the good of the community around you, being people who look not inwards to ourself, but outwards to love and serve because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he sets this as an example for ourselves. And then this one here, breaking of bread. When was the last time that you uh, actually paused and counted how many times Jesus has meals with people, sits down and shares life, right? Now, I'm not talking the physical breaking of bread necessarily. Like this can happen across the table with another human being who is following Jesus, sharing life with you over a cup of coffee, over a burger and fries, or just on a walk through the park, or sitting in your living room on the couch, sharing life in a meaningful, intimate way is a spiritual practice. So these are kind of the six non-negotiable pillars that we all need in our life, shaping us, creating space for the spirit to work and make us more like Jesus. But here's the second thing we need to know, that we are each made unique. 
God made each and every one of us different on purpose. And because God made each of us unique, God is prepared to encounter each of us in unique ways. Right? So I said there are six kind of like pillars in the spiritual disciplines, but then each one has so many different ways. For example, worship, some of us uh, may love to worship in a massive crowd of people um, just like singing these really upbeat, awesome, engaging um, songs of worship. And that may be a space where you just encounter God so clearly and the barriers are torn down and the Holy Spirit is flowing in your life and he is shaping you to become more like Jesus. And then for some of us, our, our most meaningful moments of worship may look like reciting the Psalms. Maybe with a quiet cup of tea or on a walk through nature. We are each different and unique and God knows that. And I love that the church ha has explored over its history so many different ways of doing each of these six essentials so that there are spiritual practices for everybody. But to help you narrow it down in your app notes, uh, we've also included a link to something to help you identify your spiritual pathways. It's just this language of like, what is the way you connect with God the best? Because that is a great place to start building these structures. But then here's the third thing. We build up, right? So we want to start where you're most comfortable, where it is most natural for you to meet with God, because that's going to be the easiest space to create room for God's spirit to work in your life and form these good things in you. But we cannot just stay there, because here's the thing. What happens if the vine is growing and you are growing plentiful, great fruit? Are you going to just leave it as is? Or is that actually going to stop it from growing any further? If you, if you build a nice little trellis and you get your grapevine and it's growing and it's producing fruit and you just leave it and don't do anything else, all of the good work that, it want, that God wants to do is actually capped. It's limited by the structures because then it reaches a point where you have not put anything in to sustain what God wants to do in your life. So we continue to build as God works in us. He produces good things in us. He forms us more and more like Jesus. Then we need to begin to stretch and grow because we cannot grow in a safe, comfortable little place. We actually need to produce structures that are gonna challenge us, push us outside of our comfort zone to see God at work in our life, forming Jesus in us in ways that are deeper and greater than we have seen before. We need to be prepared to build up. It's like in training. For those of you who have ever like worked out trying to like build muscle mass, it, if you start with like, I don't know, 10 pounds and you never progress, are you going to get anywhere? Yes and no. You're gonna, you're gonna hit the limit of what that 10 pounds is gonna do for you. And you might be like, yeah, great. I went from like a twig to like, I, I bulked up a little bit. This is great. This is awesome. I'm going to keep going exactly as I am. And then you're not actually going to see growth. We, we understand that we actually have to increase the challenge level if we are going to get better, if we're going to grow. So if we want to create space for the Holy Spirit to do these awesome things in our life, to shape us more and more like Jesus, we have to increase the challenge level of the practices of Jesus in our life. I like what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. We need to introduce into our life the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines, the practices from the way of Jesus. We need to cultivate the life of God in us. He and he alone does the hard work, but we need to put the structures in place. All right, so these three kind of keys, know the disciplines, know that you're unique and how God made you, and build up, add on, don't just stop and limit what God wants to do in you. These are things that we can take and we, we can apply in our life. I love that um, 
normally when I talk about spiritual disciplines, I talk about a spiritual discipline and I say, let's all go home and try this. But here I'm saying, no, go home and build structure in your life to allow God to work. And you know who's going to be able to help you figure that out? You, God, and your community. See, um, it, it's actually important to our design that God created us to not do life alone. I think that our celebration communities are one of the healthiest places for us to figure this out, to build this structure, because we can keep each other accountable. We can share with one another our, uh, our uh, challenges, our hardships, where um, we're thriving, what God has been doing in our life, practices that have helped us to create space for the Spirit of God to work in us. I think that actually, if you're not in a celebration community, if that's not something that you've decided to commit to yet, I would encourage you that that, in fact, may be the, the, the first step in you building these structures. Because that is a space where you can practice the breaking of bread, the fellowship together, and grow in all of these others. So I'm actually going to close us out by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to show you where you need structures in your life. And then go home and yeah, if you're in a community, talk this out with your community this week. If you're not, talk this out with the people in your life. Look at where, may, maybe you have some good structures around prayer, but you can't remember the last time that you actually spent time in scripture there's a place where you can start. Maybe worship is something that, that you do every day, but you can't remember the last time you shared the good news. There's a place you can begin. And do it in community. I, I encourage you, if you've not yet, to reach out and, and get into a celebration community and do this. Before I close out, I also want to remind us that actually tonight, if you don't have plans yet, now you do, because you're invited to come join us at the church at 7 p.m. for our prayer and praise. What an amazing space, especially if prayer or worship is one of those things where you kind of struggle. You don't actually have much um, in your life to create space for God to meet you there. Uh, come and experience what it is to just be in the presence of God through prayer and worship together in community. It is honestly one of the most amazing moments every month when we gather for prayer and praise, 7 p.m. here at the church. All right now, let's create space for the Spirit to speak to you, to point you in the right direction. Where is it that He is asking you to let Him move so He can build these good things in you? Yeah, Father, we thank you that you are a good and loving God. God, we thank you that you desire to, to build good things in us, to uh, grow good things in us. God, that you want to make us people who look like Jesus, people of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And thank you, Jesus, that you show us how to remain in you. Holy Spirit, show us where, where we are lacking in our practices. Where we have not been creating space for you to work in our lives. And help us in community together to put in place those structures. God, thank you for the wisdom of your people down through the ages who've come up with with thousands of ways to practice the way of Jesus. That each of us can meet with you and be transformed by you. And if you're, you're hearing this and you've never actually put your faith in Jesus, but you want this life, you want to be a person of love, joy, peace, patience, you want to find rest for your soul, you want life in all of its fullness, and you're feeling that tug, then I'd invite you to pray this with me. Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much, 
that you sent Jesus to die on the cross to get rid of my sin. I turn away from my sin and turn away from my striving and I turn to you. Thank you for Jesus' resurrection that brings me brand new life. Thank you for your spirit who comes to live with me, to bring good into my life, and to shape me like Jesus. Help me follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you've said yes to Jesus for the first time, make sure you uh, let us know by clicking the button in the chat that says, I decided to follow Jesus. And for all of us, I encourage you to take some time and go this afternoon and sit and speak with God. Look at your life. See where you've been rushing past and missing opportunities for God to grow these good things in your life you can't do it on your own. Only Jesus can. Now go and live a life that celebrates God. Thank you for joining us at Celebration Church today. It's been great to have you with us. We really hope that you encountered God in a meaningful and a personal way. If you'd like prayer for anything, one of our hosts would love to pray with you right now. You can request prayer by hitting the request prayer button in the chat. We would love to know that you're part of the Celebration community. The best way to do that is to fill out one of our Connect cards. Again, the link to that is in our chat. If you'd like to partner with us financially and help us to spread the message of God's goodness and grace with the world, you can do that by visiting our website at happychurch.ca. There's always a lot happening at Celebration Church outside of our Sunday morning worship celebrations. If you'd like to stay up to date with all that's happening around, around the church, you can sign up for our weekly pastor's update, again, by visiting our website, happychurch.ca, and scrolling to the bottom of our homepage. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week. Live a life that celebrates God.